Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cindy Alvarez and Ethan Goresh. Hello, I'm Cindy Alvarez. I run the product design and user research teams at Yammer, which a little over a year ago was acquired by Microsoft. Hi, my name is Ethan Gresh. I'm a lead program manager uh, at Microsoft who acquired Yammer. And we're here today to talk about transitioning teams to lean uh, from the bottom up. The hope here uh, is that from the story we're going to tell about you know, Microsoft, who hopefully most people have heard of, uh, large software company, long history, a uh, lot of ingrained culture about how we do things or did things, and the story of the sort of journey that we're on in the hopes that others can learn from that as well. And hopefully the clicker works. Ah, cool. <laughs> All right, everyone gets the image? Yeah, awesome. So uh, Microsoft, our history, waterfall development. Right? We got really, really good at shipping software, running the trains on time every two to three years. Uh, big release. Uh, lots of QA or lots of market research, planning, specking at the front. Uh, two to three years to develop, do QA, run betas, launch the product. And this has worked really well. We don't do it or we didn't do it because we're stubborn and hate this approach. We did it because it worked. And the things to note about it, though, is that even though you could look at this model and say totally different, unapplicable to everything that you've learned in the last few days or before, the truth is we actually had a lot of the ideas uh, even running in this model. If you think about build, measure, learn, uh, it just so happens that build took two to three years. <laughs> measure was easy. Uh, we could measure revenue. You'd launch a product, you'd sell it. And learning, well, it took a while to actually apply. It's actually kind of the root of the old joke, for which I'm going to date myself a bit, of people used to joke, you know, don't buy a Microsoft product till version 3. That's when they get it right. That's actually sort of that manifestation of the build, measure, learn cycle. We'd build v1 because we had an idea. Uh, we'd, we'd launch it. We'd start to hear feedback about it while we were already starting v2. Uh, but by the time we got around to planning v3, we'd learned enough about v1. We could build something <laughs> right. We had learned. And so that's really a lot of where that comes from. Of course, the problem is, if you think about the future, uh, and cartoon Steve Baum over here, we, think, we recognize the future is different, right? It's about devices and services. It's a really exciting new world that we're in. And we know that uh, we have to adapt or die. Uh, it's weird to talk about Microsoft dying, but we actually talk about it internally a lot. It scares the crap out of us. And so we realize that if you think about that V1 to V3 joke, that's five years in a three-year cycle. Uh, within five years, Google Docs went from some adorable little toy to a real existential threat to one of our biggest businesses. So it's something we think a lot about, and it's sort of the root in some ways of this talk we're going to do today around how we want to evolve. So when Yammer was acquired, we heard Steve Ballmer talk about devices and services, and we were really excited because we were a startup, we were moving fast, we are like, great, you know, we're not going to get swallowed up by this big, slow-moving company. They're all on board. We've gotten this from the CEO on down, uh, guarantee that we're going to move faster. And what did we get? Um, we got, instead of three-year cycles, one-year cycles that still had a lot of upfront planning and a lot of then developing and not a lot of learning on the way. On the other words, in other words, mini waterfalls. And that's what you get with a top-down mandate. You get mini waterfalls because that's people doing what they've always done and what they've always known how to do. So this was kind of our reaction to that. Great. Uh, OK, well, at least it's, it's better than it has been in the past. Uh, so uh, people have seen this before. <laughs> Quick show of hands, you read XKCD. Awesome, good, I do too. I think it's hilarious. Uh, and the thing I actually want to show today, uh, other than we can laugh at ourselves, <laughs> is uh, the overall structure, right? If you ignore the guns, uh, we should talk about the historical role of the guns, what we're doing to get rid of them. That's its whole other talk. But the important thing to realize today is Microsoft's actually pretty decentralized and fairly bottoms up. Uh, it turns out that we work in a lot of really decentralized teams to build products, build features, make decisions about what our goals are, what our metrics are, what we want to validate, what we want to learn, uh, what things we're going to build and not build. 
a lot of those choices were small and localized. So to go to Cindy's point, when you think about top-down saying we want to do things differently, that's adorable, uh, and it's a righteous thing to want to do. <laughs> uh, and sponsorship from the top is really important. I don't mean to dismiss it. We could not succeed without it. But it's not sufficient. You actually need the people who are doing the work, the people like pe uh, sort of my engineers, the product people who work for me, my, my direct management, all those people who actually build the product have to be bought in to wanting to work differently. So we realized that in order to actually move into a cycle of build, measure, learn, we couldn't jump into doing that with the product. The organization just isn't ready for it yet. But this is a great method for also working on process. We need to adapt, build, measure, learn, and make it something that we put into the process of building software at Microsoft. So the first thing we needed to do is, is start learning. And basically, this is what happens when, when we first came in. So if for any of you who've seen this particular South Park episode, uh, it's the underpants gnomes. And they have this great business idea in which step one is collect underpants, and step three is profit. And then they're very unclear about what happens at step two. And this is actually what happened when, when Yammer folks came in and started talking about things like the lean startup and how we can move fast and how we can be innovative. Um, you know, we kind of held up the lean startup, and we were very philosophical. And that worked great for the C-level execs, by the way. They love the high-level philosophy. But the people that Ethan was just talking about, their day-to-day -day jobs, they're like, okay, what's in the middle? And when we were light on details, this just sounded ridiculous. No one wanted to listen to us. And that was not a good place to start from. So the next thing we tried to do is, is to basically do the equivalent of a flash mob. We had a mini lean day, I, you know, something that I brought a bunch of people up, and we scheduled this a day in advance, and we're like, we had talks planned, we're going to talk about designing quickly with, you know, designing quickly, we're going to talk about developing quickly, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, MVPs. And this is not a culture where uh, a spontaneous gathering really worked. So the, the Microsoft people are kind of like the, the guys walking along the side here, they're not really paying attention. So for every calendar invite that I sent out, I got back you know, at least two people saying, well, I can't show up. I'm, I'm booked with meetings. It's a very meeting-heavy culture. But what did happen is when we did this is we had like 20 or 30 people who showed up. And when you have 20 or 30 people, you don't throw a conference. You just put all up a circle of chairs and start talking. And we learned from that that we did have basically what we'd call an early evangelist population, people who were so desperate and so eager to hear about this that they're willing to cancel some meetings and trek out to the buildings. Microsoft is like the size of a city, so actually showing up to a meeting across campus is a huge thing. Um, so we knew that there were people who were interested. We just needed to get the right approach. Unfortunately, uh, this is basically what Microsoft employees think of when you say minimum viable product. So one of the first things we learned is that all the language that you have heard for the last two th days did not fly there. When we talk about minimum viable product, people immediately panic. They say, we are building enterprise software. Our customers have a quality bar. Um, the GE folks were, were very similar. They're saying, you know, do you want a minimum viable MRI machine? Same thing with your enterprise software. And we realized pretty quickly that you can't just take the language that you're using and expect people to adapt to that. You have to meet people where they are today. And so that meant that one of the things we did is say, forget it. Let's stop saying an inviolable product. So we actually had to go back, in a sense, to first principles and think about what did work. How do we reach these people? Uh, and we realized that it's important to actually start from where people are coming from, right? Even though. Uh, in Microsoft, uh, number one, by the way, the words the lean startup, we didn't even use that much uh, simply because we don't want to get into the, into the debate about what is a startup, the correct We're definition. We're not a startup. Yeah. We make more money than all these startups put together. Exactly. And so <laughs> uh, there's some battles we didn't even want to fight uh, over terminology per se. Instead, the key was really about building bridges, uh, again, get it, of reaching out to the things people understood. And in our case, uh, the first big pivot that we did when we hit this wall around MVP and getting people involved was around uh, appealing to what people actually understood. Uh, so we went back to sort of scientific method. We talked about hypotheses. We talked about the ideas of you've always had hypotheses when you've planned something. You've always, we've always built towards a vision, and that vision, while we didn't call it as much, is a hypothesis. So wouldn't it be great if you could actually learn more about if you were right earlier? 
Uh, and that really subtle wording change saying in effect the exact same thing to at least everyone in this room had a huge impact. When we started doing that, people started uh, coming and talking to us. People started listening. They started asking really interesting probing questions. They started asking for our help to get started. Suddenly we're a lot smarter. Yeah, suddenly we're a lot smarter, more popular, better looking. Everything. It was really. amazing. And uh, that was one of the really important steps was around taking that pivot and around how we even thought about this whole process. And the other thing that we did uh, that was really interesting and valuable is recognizing that in the Microsoft culture, uh, we're kind of averse to coaching. Uh, we do have a lot of groups that do coaching, and there's a lot of righteous work that they do around training and engineering excellence and those sort of things. And it's not that we're strictly opposed to it, but if you think about that uh, org chart with the guns I showed a minute ago, uh, again, the thing to take away from it, we are these sort of decentralized bubbles. And so in order to actually affect change, you have to have someone helping spread the word that has credibility within that bubble, someone who's built software in the waterfall way before, uh, which is how I came into this mission, and who also sort of learned the new way uh, and can actually help articulate not just, hey, here's what you should do, but hey, here's what we've been doing in this new light. Uh, another example of something we did that was hugely valuable was talking about failed experiments. Uh, we didn't ever think at Microsoft that we built experiments at all, but the fact is that we did. And so frankly, just having a historical context and being able to talk to teams and say, hey, remember that thing we built together three years ago that seemed like an awesome idea on the day we started, but we kind of had our doubts the day we shipped, and we really had our doubts six months later when we got our first bug report, and it was really obvious the bug was so bad, no one could possibly have been using the feature. This must be the first person to try it. Uh, everyone sort of at least had that feeling before of, uh, that's a shitty feeling. Uh, that's not what we seek to do when we build software. And we didn't think of it as an experiment, but if you're actually going to inspire people to do something different, you have to meet them where they are. And so that was a really important step for us. So some of the things that have worked. Um, changing language has worked hugely. Tag teaming between Ethan and I has worked hugely. He's based in Redmond full time. I'm in San Francisco and I go up about every six weeks. We exchange notes constantly on what we've done and how it has worked. So we are basically iterating constantly on how we talk. I tried this and it was very receptive. Uh, and people were very receptive to it. We tried that and it didn't work so well. Um, we sought out people who were willing to talk to us and we asked for recommendations of other people. We have also figured out which teams are interested, and we've been providing them with more coaching as well. Experimentation. As Ethan said, people like the scientific method at Microsoft, so we ran with that. Experimentation has been huge. We've been getting people thinking on the mindset of, this is an experiment, you need to validate it. Even for teams where there has already been work in progress, so those mini waterfalls where people are like, well, we're already shipping this feature, we're already building this feature, we had them retroactively go back and think about what were you trying to prove? What, is, what were you trying to validate here? And so just getting people in that mindset of this is what we were trying to prove and this is how we'll know when we've succeeded, even if it wasn't at the beginning of the cycle, has been, has been really valuable in getting people into that thinking. And culture of data. Yep, so the other big thing that we're, has been interesting for us in our model, and again, it's something I'd say it's an interesting contrast in a sense to, I think, GE's story where they got top-down buy-in <laughs> on we want to adopt the lean startup model whole hog, we want Eric to come in and talk to everyone. Uh, we had to evolve and adapt a bit, and so as Cindy mentioned, this scientific method, this idea of hypotheses sort of started taking off. And so we said, great, let's run with that. Let's adapt the way we think about planning processes to at least start asking the questions like, what are your riskiest assumptions? How will you know if you're wrong? Right? Really great steps and things that everyone has already sort of started doing. The challenge that we have is sort of uh, we don't know how to measure everything that we want to yet, certainly not within the product and real telemetry. We have a bunch of instrumentation. We actually have a long history at Microsoft <laughs> of instrumenting for verification. So if anyone's ever seen uh, the customer experience improvement program, it's sort of buried in every product that we've built. Uh, it phones them when you have crashes. So we're used to collecting data, but not the right data, not the data you know, that we've seen and you think about Moneyball and all the great analyses we do here and not vanity metrics. There's a ton of work we have to do. So we're actually sort of on these parallel tracks right now. But on the one hand, getting everyone to think in terms of hypotheses, acknowledging that in the short term, you can't validate everything yet with real live service data. But then in parallel, trying to build out the service data, right, and the whole infrastructure for that. And even for us, that's another place where uh, tag team experience has been super valuable. One of the things we love about 
uh, the amazing talent we acquired from Yammer is the strength around data analytics and the expertise that we have there. Uh, and we've combined that with teams like mine that have a knowledge of the existing Microsoft technologies, how to build software, our deployment systems, our operations. So we can actually build out together the data infrastructure to uh, sort of just in time start building out the telemetry we'll need to learn, what we need to learn to really practice this at full speed. But in the crawl, walk, run approach, it's been really useful for us to sort of separate out those two discussions. Build hypotheses if you can't test them yet, and we're working to build the data, and we'll figure out a plan in the meantime, but just start. Start with the things that you can. If you can do something today, here's what it would be. Mm -hmm. And that's been hugely impactful in even just a few months. Um, and finally, our version of a our version of a concierge MVP, which you know we have a minimum viable slide here because it's kind of wrapping onto the other line, is that um, <laughs> we've taken the teams that are ready to act in this way, and we've basically been treating them the same way you would early customers, giving them a ton of help, giving them a ton of hand-holding, explaining how you do things, walking through, listening to their hypotheses and seeing how we would might do them differently, listening to their metrics, and perhaps offering some advice about what they should or shouldn't be measuring. Um, so it's very, very time intensive, and it's very hand-holding, and it's absolutely not scalable because there's two of us and there's a handful of other people doing this, but it is teaching us what we need to learn in order to make this something that is more scalable across the almost 200,000 full-time people who are making Microsoft work. So this is how we've basically taken this process and turned it into something that we can then turn into a product later. This is us. We live on the Death Star. Our contact information is here. Uh, looks like we have a couple minutes, so if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to take a couple. And actually, stand up if you want to ask a question. That way we can find you and we'll get mic runners out. Uh, yes? So you said that you had to... Oh, hang on for the microphone. You said you had to change the terminology to all MVP, and so what did you call it? Well, in our case, we sort of started calling it hypothesis-driven development, and we actually sort of brushed aside the notion of MVP, right? The idea of the noun being the thing you're going to build, the sort of what MVP is trying to be. Uh, we started from the principles, right? You have a hypothesis. You will need to prove it. Of course, once you figure out what it is, you will need to build something to prove it. And ideally, you will build something quick that you can use, right? But the problem we had is, frankly, by the time we started getting traction with the audience, uh, MVP suffered from sort of one of two problems, uh, in my opinion. The one of them is the one Cindy alluded to, right? Everyone saw the bag of crap uh, <laughs> and said, no, 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 that's not something we can do. Or even worse, uh, some teams we talked to actually said, MVP, that's a different label for my V1, for my milestone build, for the thing I was already doing. Awesome. This is going to be easy. Right. And so the problem we had was that, uh, like I said, it's either people had a problem with the word, or even worse, they'd already defined it to mean something we didn't want. And it would have been great to fight that fight and say to every person, no, 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 you haven't read the book. You can't use that word yet. <laughs> uh, but that's sort of a losing battle when you're talking to really smart people. So I had uh, a question. I really appreciate your transparency and how you guys are sharing out kind of your journey. You know, yesterday, GE was on stage talking about, you know, a really, an institution with 300,000 people, right, trying to figure out how they're going to implement lean. And they talked a lot about top, down, and bottom up. And I think they're talking a lot about your bottom up efforts. Are you getting any buy in higher up that's helping you? Like, where do you think this is headed, or where are you hoping it's headed? And what have been some of those challenges in getting top down support? So, you know, I kind of opened by saying I, th I feel like we've, we've had top down support in that, you know, Steve Vollmer was like, we need to move faster. The, we've had a lot of partners saying we need to move faster. But, you know, as Ethan said, they're not the ones making the decisions. I think. I, maybe, even maybe more than bottom up, I would describe what we're doing as like middle out. Uh, it's, it's sort of the, the managers, the principal managers who have maybe one or two levels of people reporting. That's actually where a lot of the decisions are being made. So when we can win those people over, they're basically then bringing a case to the partners and saying, we think we should do this. And you know, the, one of the refreshing things about Microsoft that, that I've found as a new person is that the partner level folks seem awfully you know, open to just to uh, accepting what their leads bring to them. So it's really the people at Ethan's level and the people one level above him that we need to convince, and that's where we've been targeting. Yeah, and it's, it's important to know, too, I think, that uh, 
like everyone else, right, as engineers, we pattern match. It's what we do. And so part of the challenge is even if you're a director, right, a vice president, uh, it's great to say, I love this idea. We should experiment. We should do stuff. But the problem is, if you've had an approach that's worked before, and you have a bunch of people saying they want to do something different, right, uh, how do you make that choice? How do you choose to fund something new? And the, the, it's sort of a classic chicken and egg problem, but the way we've always broken the logjam at Microsoft is uh, everyone does feel empowered to go do the right thing. That's sort of always been in our DNA. We talk a lot about whenever someone will say, oh, the rules say I should do X, but I think, the, you know, I think it's Y, and I'll go to my boss and say, what do I do? And I say, well, do the right thing, which is sort of this, uh, you could positively say it's you're empowered to do you know, what you think is best. You could negatively say your manager wants plausible deniability uh, for not actually <laughs> saying don't do the thing that's official. Uh, but it turns out we need examples. And so part of the reason the middle out approach is so important is we start to have these success stories, right? One of the greatest things, actually a really good thing, we acquired many great things from Yammer, but a surprisingly good thing that we acquired that's gotten a lot of mileage for us is uh, a written record of experiments that have been done. So if we're going to say experimentation is good, uh, it's great to say, you know, that's a good thing to do. You can get tons of lifts, uh, you know, in your engagement or user retention. But the treasure trove of examples we now have, right, and that we heard some today too, even uh, in the A-B testing session in this room a few hours ago, right, telling our management, uh, here's an example of something that Yammer did before we bought them or even after, that this was a small change to a bit of copy or this was a five-line CSS change and it had a huge impact on retention and we would never have guessed that. Uh, those kinds of stories help and it's why we go middle out and just try to, you have to build examples. It's something that, I know Scott Birkin, uh, who's an author who I know his books are outside, uh, talks about is, you know, the way to influence change is sort of find the thing you can control, and demonstrate success there, and then you get to expand. And that's really how our culture's always been. So finding a few teams, getting a few wins, uh, is the thing that empowers management at the top, not just to say, yes, that's what I want, but you need to let them say, this is what I want more of, right. by showing them what it is. Right. Ask forgiveness, not permission. Yes. Yeah. First of all, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, just curious, uh, the time frame, at least to get that first win, and you get that first buy-in, and then subsequent time frames to sort of exponentially get more and more buy-in as you go along, expanding on that. So I think, as Ethan said, at Yammer, we release twice a week. We're constantly running experiments. I'd say we probably get an experiment result back every two to three weeks. So we had kind of a steady cadence of that from the beginning. So we've had a lot of these kind of use cases, I'd say. How long do you think it took us to get like a some team at Microsoft changing huh. their minds based on that? Well, that's an interesting one. I guess it depends who you ask. I'd say uh, my team, which is probably the first one to change, uh, and that's for true. reference for all the people I work with watching uh, at home and on the simulcast, not entirely my decision, a bunch of people involved. But uh, we started off, I'd say a few months after we acquired Yam and we started to work together, my team and my management sort of had this epiphany of, uh, if we want to start learning how to work in this way and learning what's good about it, we have to kind of go whole hog. And we sort of uh, switched to a functional model of staffing. We sort of cross-functionally assigned people across projects. We built a bunch of evangelists like myself just by sort of throwing them into the lion's den down here in San Francisco, so to speak. Uh, and I'd say, you know, we had that epiphany of that was the way to sort of think about integrating the acquisition probably three-ish months after we got started. Uh, it took us probably another three to six months to actually sort of start getting some wins. I started to grok the model, and I learned that MVP wasn't just the thing that the product people at San Francisco said to get me shut up, but here's what it really means. <laughs> uh, and, and there was a bit of both. But, a little bit of uh, Drew, if you're watching, we miss you. Uh, but uh, the challenge was, you know, first getting a little bit of those wins, and then, frankly, it was sort of this, this uh, sort of bowling alley effect, right, like that one slide showed. And I think it was sort of probably six months after that, I, we had the first epiphany, but after tons of evangelizing, we had a team come back to us and say, hey, we actually want to plan our strategy in this way. Uh, can you spend a day and help us? And that was in October, so probably eight or nine months after. We had the first real someone who hadn't sort of committed to take a leap actually decided it might be a good thing to do. So it's been probably, I'd say, 12 months in total to get to this point. Uh, and of course, we have a ton more to do. Uh, but it's tricky, and it's actually, it's gone, honestly, probably faster than I thought, simply because, again, it's not people being stubborn or saying change must be hard. It's that uh, we are thankfully not yet at the point where Microsoft is flaming out. Uh, we're at the point where a lot of metrics look really, really good, and you have to really be willing to look to the future to see that we're going to run out of runway. 
So I'd say within a year, the fact that we've gotten a bunch of teams to actually come around and get started, uh, I'm really excited about it. That's pretty good. 30 years of doing stuff one way and one year to make pretty good headway towards doing stuff a totally different way. So I think that's pretty good. Yeah. I think we're actually out of time. I think, so we, I think we're we in Q&A time, actually, right? Ready? Someone, yeah. sorry, someone from AV, something really <laughs> bad would happen if we were really running over, right? We'll take one, we'll take one last. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I mean, your comment about 30 years doing it one way and one year doing it differently reminds me, unfortunately, of Kodak. Uh, <laughs> because people in Kodak said, look what we've done. Why do we need to change and look what Kodak is? Apart from Steve Barnard saying we need to change things differently and sending out an email to everyone or whatever we did, um, isn't there some sense of urgency? I mean, I'd be interested if you look around this room, how many people are connected to the internet as we speak on non-Microsoft devices? And so, do, you know, th there must be some sort of sense of urgency around the need for change or, you know, here comes Kodak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, as an ex from an external perspective, I think that's one, of the, that's one of the other joys that Yammer has brought is we all came in with our Macs and our iPhones and we're like, guess what? This is what everyone around us uses. Um, but I am seeing some of that. We're seeing definitely there's a lot of recognition that people are using Google Apps, that that's a viable thing, that people n haven't just chosen their iPhones, but they love their iPhones. So I think there's definitely, there's definitely some apologists who are all pro-Microsoft all the way, but I think they're, in, they're definitely in the minority. That's been my experience. Yeah, I'd actually say, for reference, Microsoft, uh, probably ever since the iPhone, before that we could debate it, but frankly, ever since the iPhone, uh, we as a company have sort of recognized that sort of our hubris could kill us, right? There was a period of time where uh, our ability to sell to enterprises was sort of this durable asset that no one can top. Uh, most people at Microsoft are frankly over it. And in fact, when I talk about people getting used to this notion of working sort of, you know, in a lean way, working iteratively, uh, there's different groups in Microsoft who'd say, we've actually gotten it for a while. If you look at, for example, Bing on the search side, right, and the gains they've made and the iteration they do, there's a ton there. So, yeah, uh, yeah I'd say we at Microsoft spend a lot of time worrying about not becoming Kodak or any other failure story you might describe. Uh, and it's part of why we're here and it's part of doing it there. And the, there's a healthy debate, uh, frankly, in Microsoft and elsewhere about, uh, <laughs> you know, are we already there? Is it too late? Uh, I caution anyone who tries to count us out. Uh, we've been in that spot before. But yeah, it's a reality we have to adapt to. And it's, I think, part of the reason that we've had such success changing is people recognize things need to change. This isn't just about a better way of doing things. It's about we're in a lot of trouble if we don't adapt. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. We'd love to keep taking, but we got to get off the stage and let other people on. Um, we'll be around if you see us. We're happy to answer questions, or you can find us online and ask us more. Thank you so much. Thanks.